Two of the Sony A7R4, Sony's new 60 megapixel full frame camera. It's gonna take at least another week because we had some problems that I'll discuss in just a little bit. But I am ready to share some image quality results so we can see under ideal conditions just how much more sharpness you can get out of that camera. I'm gonna discuss the pixel shift, which creates a 240 megapixel file. I'm gonna show you actually how much sharpness it has compared to the Sony a7R III. I'm gonna talk about those file sizes and what these big files are gonna to do to your storage. I'm gonna show you our results in our dynamic range tests and how the fake ISO is looking. I'm gonna show you a banding example that I found on the internet. And I'm gonna talk about exactly what went wrong in our testing because we did have some serious problems as well as the overall disappointments we had with the design, something we didn't bring up in our initial hands-on review. First of all, to talk about pixel shift, this is a technology that takes either four or more likely 16 separate images of a scene with the pixel shifting like halfway down, halfway to say the right, and then halfway down and to the right to produce a 240 megapixel file. And we are not quite ready to share those yet, though we are getting some help with those files. So hopefully soon we'll be able to show you the pixel shift results, subscribe to see those. I wanna bring up some weaknesses with this technique. First, it's technically producing a 240 megapixel file with almost a gigapixel worth of data, but the lens doesn't necessarily resolve anywhere near that. So you won't necessarily see that much detail out of it. The processing is not in camera, so there is always extra processing. And um, we found that even with the four pixel shots, the four image shots, the percentage of shots that turned out is an extremely low percentage because if the camera moves in the slightest bit, the entire thing is ruined. And so, by taking four times more pictures than it was previously, it's going to be even a lower percentage that actually turns out the camera really needs some kind of shake detection where it can tell you, oh, hey, the camera moved, so you need to retake that shot. File sizes. The JPEG files are 24 to 40 megabytes. Those are big files. The compressed raw files are about 62 megabytes. The uncompressed raw, 124 megabytes. And if you take the 16 shot pixel shift file, they're two gigabytes each, like the total of those 16 files, two gigabytes, which means if you have a 64 gig card, you can get 32 of those pixel shifted shots, on it, which means you have less space than you did on an old roll of film. So you're definitely gonna be investing in some 256 gig cards. And if you're doing like a weekend of landscape shooting, you might need a few of those. And don't forget, you wanna be recording to two card slots. So it's something to factor in. Let's look at sharpness tests that I did with our 85, meg our 85 millimeter F1.4 G Master lens, which was the sharpest lens that we had. I shot these at F4. If you want to download the JPEG versions of these files and see them for yourself, head to sdp.io slash a7r samples. That link is in the description of this video. These are from raw files. And that's important to note because I did share a JPEG image comparison before, but if the camera does different JPEG in-camera processing, then it's going to look different. Um, but if you're shooting 60 megapixel files, I suspect you're probably shooting raw. So these have been scaled to be the same size, which required me to scale up the A7R three image. You can see the settings and such here. These were shot on a tripod with a delayed shutter. Uh, I was very careful about the focusing and I shot many, many shots and then took the sharpest shot of all of that, being very careful to use the three dimensionality of the scene to verify the focusing. On the left, we have the A7R Mark III image. On the right, we have the A7R Mark IV image. And to my eye, the A7R Mark IV image looks a little bit sharper in these extreme circumstances. Now, I'm zoomed in four to one here because people have different size screens. Uh, some of you are looking at this on a mobile device, so I want you to be able to see these images. And I don't think this is blowing me away, but I definitely do see a little bit more detail here. So that's what you can expect. We have found historically that if you increase the resolution by 50%, you actually increase the amount of perceived detail with good technique and good lenses, you increase the detail by about 25%. That's about what we're doing here. So we would expect to see maybe 20% more detail with good technique and sharp images. That, that sounds about right to me, right? Let's take a look at a night scene. And here I'm gonna show you a couple of different images. Sorry, I forget where the control key is because I always switch between a Mac and a PC, okay. The A7R Mark III on the left and the A7R Mark IV on the right. This was a difficult shot, a 10 second shot. I focused on this psychic life coach sign. 
because who doesn't need a psychic life coach? And if we look at, look, look at the phone number here, you can see it's a little bit sharper in the A7R Mark IV image, but it's not going to blow you away. There is definitely more detail there, though. And let's pan over to this barbershop sign where the difference is a little more apparent. Like here, we can just kind of see, if you look at the O, you can kind of see that there's a little extra shading there that isn't is just completely lost in the 42 megapixel a7r mark III file like look at the comb there so is it a huge difference no but it's it's a difference it is a little bit sharper whether you're willing to upgrade and deal with the extra storage size that's entirely up to you to decide uh, if you're the type who wants the greatest image quality of all because you're putting months and months of work into a shot yeah, it's probably worth it to you. I think it'll probably be worth it to us, especially since the camera isn't that much more than an A7R Mark III is now. This is our dynamic range test. So what I did for this was I pushed the exposure, I took a raw shot, and then in post, I raised the exposure by five stops, and then I exported it to the JPEGs that you see here. I had to use a non-Lightroom processor because Lightroom is not ready for this new camera yet. Uh, if you look at the extremely recovered shadows here in the sign of the car. You can see, to my eye, the visible noise in the A7R Mark III image is a little bit worse than the visible noise in the A7R Mark IV image. So I feel comfortable saying that the A7R Mark IV does have slightly improved dynamic range. And I know some of you are saying, oh, who needs to push the exposure five stops? You're an idiot if you need to do that. I don't believe that to be true. I think if you're a landscape photographer and you shoot into the setting or rising sun, which is really common, then on the close side of the mountains, which are in shade, you will end up with massive amounts of shadow that might need to be recovered by six, eight stops. That's not uncommon for serious landscape photographers. So just before you dismiss this capability, just acknowledge that other people shoot a little bit differently than you. It's also really common in wildlife photography to have birds that are shot against a bright sky, but that where you can pull a lot of detail out of dark feathers and stuff if you have sufficient dynamic range. Um, I also want to make the point that I shot all of these at the base ISO 100 for both cameras. As you go up in ISO, that 60 megapixels of detail disappears. You will not see 60 megapixels of detail at ISO 200 or ISO 1600. By the time you get to ISO like 3200, I wouldn't be surprised if you're looking at more like 20 megapixels of detail, just because, you know, higher ISO images always have less detail and more noise. Speaking of dynamic range, this is what DP had, Review had to say about it. The camera offers 14-bit uncompressed RAW, and that's where... Uh, Sony's 15 stops of dynamic range figure is coming from. So if you use the compressed RAW files, you won't necessarily get that because the uncompressed, I'm sorry, you only get the 15 stops of dynamic range if you use the uncompressed RAW, if you use the compressed RAW setting, if you use the uncompressed RAW setting, it'll be limited to 14 bits of dynamic range. So I shot that with the compressed RAW and I, for what it's worth, I didn't see any actual artifacts in it, even though that's the type of shot I would have seen artifacts in, in a night shot. Um, to put that into perspective, the A7R Mark III is tested by DxO Mark has 14.7 stops, the D850 has 14.8 stops, and Sony's advertising 15 stops of dynamic range. So that's a little bit more dynamic range, and that seems to be what our image shows. So yeah, it probably has very slightly better dynamic range. Where does that come from? Probably an increase in well capacity. The well capacity is the maximum amount of light that any given pixel on the sensor can absorb, because they can just take light and take light, but then at some point they can no longer count those incoming photons in essence, and that will be the maximum amount of light that they can count. So anything above that is simply lost, and that forms the, like, um, the brightest part of the image. And here's something interesting that I found. Um, when I compared the uh, original images shot at ISO 100 between the A7R Mark III and the A7R Mark IV, the A7R Mark IV images were 0.4 stops darker. So ISO 100, if you've watched my ISO is fake video, you know that ISO is not standardized from one camera to the next. That's why your meter doesn't produce the same brightness images, but the camera's in-camera meter does okay because ISO simply is not standardized in that way. And this is true here too. Um, my estimation is that ISO 100 on the A7R Mark IV is equivalent to ISO 50 in the old film days, back when we actually had a standard for it. 
The XO mark measures the A7R Mark III, ISO 100 as equivalent to ISO 70, and the DA50's ISO 64 is equal to ISO 44. So what this means to me is that the A7R Mark IV, they simply took the lowest, the base ISO of the camera, the maximum amount of light that it could gather, and set that to ISO 100. But it's actually ISO 50, and that puts it pretty comparable to the amount of light that the D850 could gather at its base ISO. The actual numbers are sort of irrelevant. If you're looking at comparison images though, you will need to adjust those images to make sure that they are the same brightness. And that's what I did in the previous images. I had to lower the brightness of the A7R Mark III images so that they wouldn't be different brightnesses despite the fact that they had the exact same exposure settings. Banding is going to be an issue on any camera that uses an electronic shutter. The electronic shutter on the A7R Mark IV is optional like it is on most cameras. Um, I did not find any banding in any of the images that I shot, but I did not shoot any fast shutter speed images under artificial lights, and that's where banding would come up. I did find a reviewer online. There's a link at the top here if you want to check out his page. This reviewer shot pictures at 1 3200th of a second under what are probably LED lights, and you can see visible banding in the background of the image. This happens because all of these mirrorless cameras with electronic shutters, um, they do not read the entire sensor at one time. They read it usually from the top of the image to the bottom of the image. The lights, all artificial lights, flicker at a certain frequency. They're just like on and off and on and off really fast, and they're so fast that your eye can't notice it. But what can happen is that as it's reading the top of the image, the light's on, and then it reads the next few rows, and then the light is flickering off. So the light is actually flickering on and off in the time that it takes the camera to read the entire image, and that will produce banding. So that will happen on this camera. It will happen on Fuji cameras, Nikon mirrorless cameras, any of these cameras that have electronic shutters. It's something to be aware of. I cannot estimate exactly how much of a problem that is. We're gonna wait until we get a longer term review copy of the camera and we'll follow up with you. Now, I wanna follow up and say that we are not able to produce our full review right now because both Chelsea and I got separate copies of the Sony a7R IV, excuse me. And they both had similar problems with focusing, specifically with eye detect focusing. And all of the shooting events that they had set up for us were portrait shooting events. And that basically meant that we didn't really get much productive time with the camera. Now. We also had focusing problems with the new Canon mirrorless cameras and the new Nikon mirrorless cameras. And in all three cases, we took the problems to the representatives of Sony there. Um, that's the advantage of being at the press event. And we showed them the problem sample pictures. They were able to reproduce the problems in all of those cases. Now, in the case of Canon and Nikon, they came back to us and said, yeah, that's about what we expect from the camera. The focusing is not gonna be perfect. In the case of Sony, they looked at the sample pictures and said, there's something wrong. This is not how the camera is supposed to perform. These cameras were their production firmware, production hardware, but they were hand assembled. So we're not sure what's happening, but we need some more time to get back to you. So Sony has taken the problem cameras that Chelsea and I both had, and they have them in the hands of engineers now, and they're trying to resolve the problem, solve it, and get us new cameras that will allow us to more thoroughly and reliably test what we expect to be the results that you should see with production cameras. I wanna bring this up because I, I, I can't say for sure whether I would recommend the camera based on the experience that I had, even though we loved things like the deeper grip and the better buttons, and I like the higher megapixels and the image quality, that I feel confident in, but the overall usability, specifically in relation to eye detect autofocus, I simply can't say at this point. Also, we're missing software, like software to process the pixel shift images and software to do like the wireless tethering to PCs and stuff. So some of that will be coming soon. I also, because we didn't bring it up in our first video, I wanna talk about some disappointments that we had with it. Of course, we're disappointed that it doesn't have a flip screen. It has great video capabilities, but if you're ever a person who sometimes films yourself, which is almost everybody it seems nowadays, sometimes you might wanna film yourself. A flip screen is an absolute necessity. It's something that the camera doesn't have. The menu systems have not really changed. They are still pretty frustrating to use. It's still very hard to find that one setting that you need to change buried on some menu somewhere. There's no search function. Things are cryptically named. But I will say we specifically made fun of their naming for their time lapse feature, which was interval shoot funk. They changed that. This camera, it says interval shoot funk. 
And I'm like, okay, so they are listening. They did make a minor change, even though it wasn't the complete UE overhaul that we were hoping for. This camera has a touchscreen, but it is still not as fully functional as a Canon or Nikon camera. Those cameras simply work better. This camera also lacks lower res raw options, something that like the D850 and Nikon Z7 have. I would love to be able to produce a 24 megapixel raw file for those times when I don't need 60 megapixels of file and I don't necessarily want to deal with it. This is a high resolution, high image quality camera, but to make it a more multi-purpose camera, it would definitely be useful to be able to scale this down. Buffering is a massive problem on this camera, bigger than just about any camera since the Pentax K1. It has a buffer that can store about 65 images, but it shoots 10 frames a second. And if you're shooting sport, sports or portraits or something, you can fill that up in, you know, six seconds. With the cards that we were using, the buffer was taking more than a full second per image to clear. So if you filled the buffer, you would be waiting a full minute before you could access certain menu settings, record video, etc. Now, using faster cards could help resolve that problem. Incidentally, we started our shooting out, uh, our shooting with the cameras with a single high-speed card, but that card produced a bunch of corrupted images. And so we had to fall back to uh, slower speed, high-performance high UHS-1 cards, but not UHS-2 cards. So we are going to provide a more detailed testing of the buffering and show you how it works in the real world once we can fill it up with two UHS-2 high-speed cards. The video also lacked a jump in performance. It's still just 4K 30. It does not do 4K 60. It does not do 10 bit. And, you know, we're looking at four years after other cameras have had 4K 60, after my smartphone has had 4K 60, we'd still be really excited to get those capabilities. And every time it doesn't come up, we're kind of like, oh, I really wanted that. It's a $3,500 camera, which to me is underpriced. I think they could have charged $5,000 for this camera. It's a shot across the bow of Canon and Icon, something that's gonna make it really difficult for them to release profitable cameras in the future. I can only imagine that Sony's strategy is to have everybody buy their bodies at this very low price point and then maybe make money off of the lenses. Or maybe they figured out how to make bodies extremely cheaply and nobody else can match that. But the the value here is much better than just about any other high resolution camera that you can get. Subscribe to see our full review. We're gonna compare it against other th cameras like the Nikon Z7, those medium format Fuji cameras, including the GFX 100, 100 megapixel camera to see just how much more detail you get. And if the pixel shift in the Sony will actually allow it to outperform the medium format cameras. And if you have follow-up questions, something I might be able to answer based on our time with it so far, write a comment down below. Bye and thanks.